got a lot of information for us from this uh the Whitney plantation just started following her on Twitter or X formerly known as Twitter. I don't know if she'll follow, follow me back. Have to see, but there she is. It seems like, seems like a pretty cool follow. Can't recommend Twitter anymore, but there it is. So today we're going to be talking about the, the history of slavery, of enslavement, especially in the Americas. We're going to wind in and out of Smith's book. I want to expand it a little bit from some of the things that Smith talks about to talk about uh, how slavery in the Americas more broadly than just the United States. And I want to do that in part because of something that I've been thinking about since some of you cited this in Damaris, the tour guide from New York City. History is no longer taught, or when it's taught, it's taught incorrectly. So this was something that we read about in what well, was a later chapter, but we read first in Smith about the teaching of history and how, how these histories are, are often not taught to us, or if they are, they're taught weird to us. So what's the first problem alex with many of these histories trying to get a history of enslavement what happens when we go looking for them yeah so that one of the problems of i mean then we'll be talking here about how many stories are lost and as a result there's a tendency that we talk about only the heroes, the people like Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman who escaped. And Smith himself says that he felt guilty when he read about these people and he thought, why didn't everybody try to escape? Why didn't all the people just run away or get out? And what he says here is that, you know, this was a, an incredibly abusive system. And yeah, there were a few people who managed to escape and write down their story, but we shouldn't necessarily just talk about the few kind of people who made this almost superhuman effort. There were also amazing people who never made it, who never got their stories recorded, who had to live out their lives in the system for various reasons. Some of them had, you know, children, parents who were all involved in this or were in a place when it, should, it was basically impossible to escape. So that's one of the issues that we have in simply trying to recover some of these histories. The other issue that gets talked about in this chapter is the idea that there were all these good slave owners, like Jefferson, for example, is described as, you know, this good owner. And uh, our guide tells us that this is the, this is the number one question that she gets uh, more from the, the white visitors to the plantation is, were there any good ones? And that's because we have in our history uh, been, there were various textbooks and mythologies written that portrayed uh, slavery as basically a benevolent system, a way in which people were educated, that the plantations were more like schools. Actually, for those of you who read the news or looked at the news in the last couple months, this came up in a debate about the Florida education system, which recently made a similar claim in their textbook that the enslaved people were able to use their skills to uh, to get jobs when they when they were uh, when they got out of uh, got out of slavery. Uh, and, you know, certainly people learn, learn skills. Um, we saw in the last class about the, the nail making and all kinds of things that were done on the plantations. But the other side of this is that oftentimes the people who were brought in from West Africa, actually, they were taken for their skills in, this, in the sense that they had a lot of knowledge of various agricultural practices which they used uh, in 
the American South. And so you could say that the people who were uh, enslaving them were learning as much from the enslaved as vice versa. But this has been a persistent myth in our society. And as our guide says, Yvonne says, you know, yeah, you you kidnap my kid, but at least you fed him well. Like it doesn't make any sense. These people were involved in in a brutal system. But she then goes on to say that if it's only a story about brutality, then you miss the people who were resisting, creating new things. Uh, being people within this system. And so she says that one of the other questions that she gets, perhaps primarily from uh, African-American or black visitors is, why didn't you tell them how bad it was? Why didn't you tell them about this? Why didn't you tell them how bad things were? And she says that it's important not to only tell these stories of dehumanization and brutality. Why, Jalen? Why do we why do we why do we have to tell more than just the brutality stories of people in the past? What happens if we only see people as objects of violence and brutality? Yeah, I mean it's sort of not seeing them in their full contribution and their full humanity. And so and this is a you know a really great quote from uh, Holden. If you can't see them for being people, you can't see me as a person. So that in some ways, trying to figure out and trying to navigate is a very difficult history to navigate because you're kind of always been between. We are describing some truly awful and terrible and brutal things that happened, but. It's, you know, you don't, you kind of have to navigate between these, these extremes to try and figure out, you know, that these were, were human beings and are human beings in the present. And if we don't see people as people in the past, it's hard to see people as people in the present. And so uh, uh, the historian Ibrahima Sek, Dr. Ibrahima Sek also talks about the, the contributions of music and the Delta blues that was born or, well, I mean, I guess we might say continued in Mississippi and Louisiana because in some ways it was a part of the West African musical tradition, which then becomes, it's, it's hard to imagine any form of later American music like rock and roll without the contribution of the Delta blues. There would be no American music tradition in some ways without the, uh, the way that this was developed. Um, this is a picture of Mississippi Fred McDowell, one of the uh, Delta Blues players that played in the 1920s. You can find out more about Ibrahim Sack if you look for him on YouTube or podcasts. He actually does a lot of presentations. He shuttles between Senegal and uh, the Whitney Plantation I was tempted to show you his one and a half hour lecture on YouTube, but we don't have time, which will you can go through and look at the he shows you pictures of people in, in West Africa playing uh, uh, banjo like instruments compared with people in the in Louisiana, Mississippi playing guitar, et cetera. So, you know, interesting, really interesting person. Another person you can recommend. I haven't found him on Twitter yet. So like I want to talk a little bit about the, the what is called the slave trade or the transatlantic enslavement, where people were taken mainly from West Africa and in the interior and brought into the Americas. Now this map shows us um, a little bit about not just where people were from, but kind of in, in rough terms, the numbers of people who went to each place. One of the things I'd like to point out to you is that almost 40% or 4 million of the 10 million or 11 million that were taken from Africa went into what is now Brazil. That was probably the single largest place. And 
Another four or five million went into the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands here. If you'll notice that the United States, where North America, is actually one of the smaller destinations for the, uh, the, the slave trade. The bulk of them went into either the Caribbean or into Brazil. Now, I want to talk about specifically the Caribbean, what is also called the West Indies. Why would we call this place the West Indies, by the way? Yeah. It's where Christopher Columbus landed, which was on the around the island of Hispaniola, or what eventually was called the island of Hispaniola. And he wanted to believe, well, he thought he was, and then he wanted to tell back to Europe because that's what he was actually looking for, was to get to Asia. He wanted to believe that he was off the coast of India. And so this region is still to this day, or certainly from this map in 1790, called the West Indies, and that's how we get the name Indians for people who are perhaps, of course, much more correctly called Native Americans or perhaps better indigenous to the Americas. So yeah, this is how we get the idea of the West Indies. If you're ever confused about where that is, that's basically the Caribbean. Some of these islands, like Jamaica, for example, received almost a million enslaved Africans. So Jamaica, this island here, got from the transatlantic slave trade almost twice as many uh, enslaved people as the entire coast of North America. Doesn't want to show us history. History keeps disappearing. There we go. And as Smith notes in this chapter, many of the enslaved Africans that were brought into the United States were brought in from um, not just from Africa, but from uh, various stops in the Caribbean. In numerical terms, it looks terms, roughly speaking, like I said, Brazil gets about 4 million, the largest percentage here. And if anybody's ever been to Brazil or knows about people in Brazil, it's an enormously diverse, phenotypically speaking, and one of the largest and most vibrant uh, African-American populations in the world. Uh, Cuba gets a lot, but the rest of the Spanish Empire, not so much, as we talked about the British West Indies, so islands like Jamaica, Barbados, the French West Indies, uh, islands like Saint-Domingue. As you can see, British North America doesn't get that much. In fact, it's about equal to a play of some players in this enslavement trade that we didn't probably think about, like the Dutch. Dutch bringing in people into Suriname, which is now and is in South America, and was used in the and various islands in the in the West Indies and the Caribbean. Now, why? When we think about the United States and enslavement, we usually think about cotton, cotton plantations. But most people who were brought into the Americas from Africa, you know why they were brought to places like Brazil and the Caribbean? Yeah, sugar. Sugar was the main demographic driver of the enslavement trade, was planting sugar. And that meant that the Caribbean plantations and the places where you could grow sugar were the most... <laughs> the most popular and the most profitable, also the most deadly. 
This was a planting, harvesting, processing sugar was one of the most <laughs> was one of the most difficult. Not that cotton and other things weren't difficult, but uh, sugarcane was particularly brutal. This is a postcard from you know 1700s that shows people planting sugarcane. Sugarcane also needed to be processed a lot of times on the plantation, as we read about here. There. This was a sugar plantation eventually in Louisiana where they processed it into molasses, which was also a, something that required an enormous amount of skill and transformation. And so some people have argued that in fact, and as you can see from this postcard, that this required a kind of industrial discipline. And then when it came to later factories that were made in the Europe and the United States, that that industrial discipline was actually based on this kind of template that came to us from the plantations. So it depended upon the human skills of the enslaved people. And as I said, there were some places in the Caribbean which imported more enslaved Africans than the entire United States, such as this very small island place of Saint-Domingue, which was a French colony, which became one of the richest places and the most profitable places in the world. And at this time, it was producing, as we can see, more sugar, coffee, indigo, and cotton as Brazil and Jamaica combined. So it's an enormously profitable place. Where's Saint-Domingue? Yeah. West Indies. It is in the West Indies. Have you ever been there? Do you know where it is? Is it like a different name now? It is a different name now. It's it's Haiti. Haiti, as comes up in this book, is actually the second independent country in the Americas. You have the U.S. Revolution, which gives us the first independent country because we always like to be number one, but this is the second independent country in the Americas before some of the other Latin American countries are gained their independence. It's also, as Smith says, the first black-led republic in the world. This is the only instance in which a massive revolt was able to overthrow the slave owners, later on overthrew the French army, which Napoleon sent to re-enslave the island. And they actually then defeated one of the largest military powers in the world and established an independent country. It's also crucial to US history. Why is it so important to us? Although we don't learn about it. Yeah. Um, it was said in the book that they kind of changed a lot in terms of slavery because in the South they got very like scared about like people being like inspired basically and like rising up to rebellion. Yeah, I mean this is this was a world shaking event. The idea that enslaved people from Africa could rebel, overthrow the system, and establish an independent country. If you were a plantation owner in the South, right, it was something that, as Smith said, hung over the South for 70 years, this idea, you know, and so you might increase your brutality, try to separate people, try to make sure that nobody was coming in that had these kinds of ideas. So it was a huge, in the course of slavery, it also did something that we do know about from U.S. history, but people rarely connect the two. Without the Haitian Revolution, there is no way that Napoleon would have sold all that land to Jefferson so cheaply. He might have sold it more expensively, but the reason Napoleon was so eager to make a deal and to sell off the Louisiana Purchase is because he had lost Haiti. Haiti was kind of the jewel in the crown, Without Haiti, he didn't have much interest in the rest of this barren land that couldn't grow sugar and didn't have any real potential, he thought. So 
basically, if it weren't for the Haitian Revolution, the westward expansion of the United States, Jefferson, who was reluctant, actually, if you remember from your history books, he actually didn't like, want to make this big land purchase. He thought it was unwieldy. Um, this would would not have happened without the Haitian Revolution. So this is a, a crucial moment, not just for, for Haiti and for the people there, also for the history of plantation slavery in the United States and for U.S. history, but we did anybody learn this in school? Learn about the Haitian Revolution and its connection to the Louisiana Purchase, and yeah, we did. All right. Eighth grade, they taught you that. Excellent. So one person did. It is rarely connected. It is rarely connected. We usually learn about the Louisiana Purchase, but we don't learn about the importance of Haiti to that. As we learned in the chapter on New York City, it was during this time of enslavement in the Americas, when people were brought from Africa into the Americas that this whole idea of race became invented. Again, like we talked about, uh, maybe it was the class before break, it wasn't that people didn't know that people were different from each other, biologically different, had different skin tones, et cetera. But the idea that people came in these races was something that was invented during this time to justify the inequalities and the system of enslavement. And so as we learned in the New York City chapter, it's really, it's not that race came first and then racism later, it's that racism, the system, created the idea of race. In this system, the Haitian Revolution became what uh, one of my mentors, Michel Rolf Trujillo, called unthinkable history. The idea that Africans could govern themselves, could overthrow a European power, was simply something that people did not believe, did not imagine, did not think was possible. And so one of the reasons that we don't learn about the Haitian Revolution is that even though they won on the ground, even though they won their independence, they were basically erased from the historical record because nobody wanted to contemplate those kinds of issues. And so some of you have probably heard the story, the, the old uh, tale that history is written by the winners, which is generally true, but there are some times in which people do win on the ground and then get written out of the history books. And this is one of those, one, one of those moments because people didn't want to believe or acknowledge that, that Africans were equally capable of self-governance, organization, and those kinds of things. So what happens is, is that as Smith points out, the industrial, what we know is the industrial revolution, another thing we probably learn about in school, it was, it was crucial to have the sugar, because the sugar was used to sweeten the tea and the coffee and the chocolate that people were using on work breaks and to provide the calories that people needed to work in those factories. So they literally fed the working classes on cheap, what became cheap calories from sugar plantations. I guess I probably should mention tobacco too, because what would a factory be without cigarette breaks? So the tobacco, the sugar, and the cotton, of course, which went into the cotton mills and the, the things, the textile industries that would be in, established in, in Britain and in the United, in the north of North America. And so slavery was crucial to this later industrial revolution. As I mentioned, some people have also argued that the whole plantation system was used as a template for northern factories. But the thing is, is that after the Industrial Revolution, a lot of these plantations, which used to be, generate lots of income and money, were kind of fell into, in, into, into those areas fell into, into poverty. 
a lot of the land was after you cultivate sugar for a long time, it actually has pretty bad environmental effects on the land. Same thing with uh, various plantation crops. And so these places which basically helped out, you might say, or were crucial to the Industrial Revolution, often became forgotten. If anybody's heard of Haiti recently, it's one of the one of the saddest stories, one of the most impoverished and politically uh, politically chaotic places in the Western Hemisphere. And so, you know, it's it's quite a quite a sad story of how of how this happened. And we learn about that a little bit in this chapter. Where is this? What's happening around the Whitney Plantation? Why is this guy able to buy the Whitney plantation for not so much money? What's, what are they doing around there? Yeah, Sophia. Um, it's in this area near all these like chemical plants called like, I forgot, there's like Cancer Alley or something. Cancer Alley. Yeah. It's a place in Louisiana where. You know, there's been some debate about why this is caused. Actually, this is a picture of it. There's all these chemical plants. It's one of the poorest places in the United States, and the rates of cancer are quite high in this area. So, you know, this has happened in a lot of the places that uh, were once the engines, the drivers of of industry and 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 profit and wealth, and then they become become dumping grounds or places where the our worst chemicals are produced. So in Louisiana, in some ways, in this chapter, we see some parts of what Louisiana and this area of the South, the enslavement practices probably looked more like what happened in the Caribbean or in Brazil, in the sense that there were as we read, there were larger numbers or percentages of, of enslaved persons in this area. So in, as, as we read here, it's as high as, say, 65% in some of these areas along the Louisiana coast. They also featured one of the things that we was forgotten from our history books, one of the largest armed rebellions of enslaved people in the in US history. So in fact, this was probably inspired by the Haitian Revolution and other uh, rebellions and revolutions uh, throughout the Caribbean, but it also happened here. And as, as he goes up to the Whitney Museum, the first thing he sees are those heads on stakes, which are what, is, what, what they did to the people when they were put down. We also see here, of course, that they were in this area, they were able to cultivate sugar. It wasn't always a sugar cane plantation, but it became one over the years. And so, in, like I said, in most of the rest of the United States in Jefferson's Virginia, they were growing other things and cotton became very important. But in this area, they were, uh, they were cultivating sugar. Now, as I mentioned on well, sugar plantation work was one of the most brutal in terms of enslavement, uh, one of the most brutal jobs. And so uh, in Brazil and San Domingue and Haiti and Jamaica, um, people would import workers and the average lifespan after being imported for the workers was about seven years. Um, now, of course, many people did survive, leave, and were able to make lives for themselves, but a lot of people died on the sugar plantations to the extent that, in some ways, uh, the, the ens enslaved African workers on many sugar plantations were probably considered more like a you know, calculated in the cost of operation, the way you would calculate the cost of a machine in terms of the profits and losses. And so this is kind of the main history of enslavement in the Americas is a sugar thing. Something 
kind of unique happens in the United States, though. So, like I said, there's lots and lots of people of African descent in the Caribbean, of course, and in the in Brazil, uh, in part because so many were imported. But something kind of unique happens in the United States, which we read about in the last chapter. If you remember, Jefferson had wanted to make the slave trade, the enslavement trade, uh, illegal, so you wouldn't be able to bring in uh, new, <laughs> new enslaved persons from Africa. And he believed that in some ways that would cause slavery to end. But what happened in the United States is even though eventually that trade was made illegal, is that people in the number of enslaved people increased through having kids that became enslaved. And as we learned about in the last chapter, this seems to be in terms of other societies, uh, there were places where people had kids, but they usually weren't necessarily born into slavery. In fact, in Saint-Domingue and the French colony, uh, the children of a white planter and a uh, a black enslaved person uh, were were freed. And so unlike in the United States and and other places, uh, they became uh, uh, freed if they were uh, if they were the children of uh, of a a white slave owner. But in the United States, as we saw in the last chapter, the slave owners kept their own children as enslaved. If you look on page 65 of Smith, so they cut off the transatlantic slave trade in, in Louisiana. Now, people still probably were smuggled in in different ways and maybe came from other states. But the number of enslaved people in the next 50 years grew by almost tenfold. And one of the things that this the, the new owner of the Whitney plantation that sort of completely pricks his conscience and makes him set this up as a museum is that he reads the description of one of, of some of the women that were on the plantation and their job description is that of a good breeder. And so, you know, this is a pretty, like I said, this is, this is a pretty unique kind of thing in the sense that that this didn't happen in different societies that practiced uh, or that imported African slaves. In the United States, this became uh, the, one of the main ways in which the number of enslaved grew. Now, that doesn't mean that it was easy. There was still a pretty high child mortality rate. And Tyler, what else happens? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's probably not documentation, but there probably was at least some infanticide of mothers who did not want their own children to have to grow up in this kind of a kind of a system. At the same time, overall, the number of enslaved people and children grew, which is one of the reasons this Whitney exhibit is probably so powerful. Right, stuff. <laughs> what do you what do what do you think about the the children part? Well, I just think that how these children were rejected, all these struggles, because the fact is they were almost born into it and they were raised like animals and they really weren't raised at all. They like we have a lot of opportunities nowadays as a, as a society, as generations, that we can acknowledge like certain struggles we go through and we can make changes and we have opportunities for that, but they had no opportunity. They were stuck where they were and they were raised to be what they were in the plantations. 
Yeah, I think it's it's super important to realize, you know, as our our guide here, and as you said, it, you know, how important the, the child aspect was to this, and you know, and today we talk about the the potential of children and how important it is, and and this was a a huge reality for uh, for the people who were who had done nothing but were born into the system as we've read often of often the offspring of of the white planter owner class a number of you also want to talk about the what happened post-mortem after death let's see bill what happens <laughs> after they die maybe you didn't talk about that sorry i'll come back to you. eric um that I think maybe it was when they were like operated on, like some like dissected for like reasons of advancing new medicine in the time, which I thought was kind of horrible. Yeah, I mean, that basically, in some ways, their bodies got dug up and used in medical schools for dissections and those kinds of things. And where else, Alexa? Um, well, like, they were also supposed to do, um, like, medical experience on them, but then they got dead and alive, so I don't think that. Yeah. The, <laughs> the origins of gynecology, actually, was experiments that were done on, uh, enslaved women, and, uh, and, to this day, there, there is a stereotype that Black people or African Americans are able to endure more pain. And so if you go into, you know, if any of you are going into the medical profession, just be careful of this. There is this idea that's in, you know, if you look statistically, uh, you know, Black people are, are less, are taken less seriously for things like, you know, if they're having a, a heart attack they might say oh you're just having a stomach ache and give you aspirin or given less pain medicine because felt like they can take it more so this is an old stereotype but it persists into medical treatment of the day uh this uh <laughs> fun book you can read about the origins of gyne american gynecology uh it re also reminded me of another pretty famous book and case about the the stem the hela cells these are sort of some of the first uh cells that were then reproduced and used in countless medical experiments i think they're still used today they were taken from uh this woman henrietta lax without her consent they were called hela cells which is the abbreviation of her first two letters and last of her first and last name. Um, if you work with stem cells at all, you've probably uh, worked with some of these cells. They are incredibly, they've been some of the most incredibly medically significant cells uh, have re kept on reproducing far past her lifetime. There were some of the first cells that people were able to, to keep on reproducing. Uh, I think recently they finally reached a settlement with the family from which these cells were taken. Um, but, you know, these are huge issues that have, you know, obviously contributed to the kind of medicine and treatment that we see today, but are still important uh, for when we go into the healthcare system and the differential treatment that people get.